Hello, this is Mr. Ferreira and I'm going to be continuing with the attachment part of the Year 12 course and we're looking at the part of the specification that says stages of att attachment and then it says identified by Schaffer. So we're going to see that one of the important people in terms of research into early child attachment is this person called Schaffer. So what we have is that there's a key study, a study that happened in 1964. So please consider maybe the context of that. Things like um, the fact that in the 1960s, there's going to be less people who are using bottles, more breastfeeding. Um, there's going to be more traditional roles in terms of male and female and things like that. And we find that these two researchers, Schaffer and Emerson, they do a longitudinal study in Glasgow. OK. And because it's longitudinal, it means it takes a time for it to develop. They're looking at these children's lives over a period of time. And at this stage, it's worth watching How Babies Form Attachment, the first video on your link. And through that video, they reference the Schaffer and Emerson study. We see that one of the key focuses of the of the research was to it says here to find out how old infants were when they first became attached. So what is quite good here in terms of psychology is that they're trying to actually understand a bit more about attachment, and for us to kind of see is is there something to this development. Um, we obviously are assuming that it's not instantaneous because obviously babies are fairly helpless and we know that they have to develop to a certain point before they become attached. And then they also want to see the strength of these attachments. And by strength, what they are saying is kind of how these attachments potentially, um, how good they are, kind of what are better attachments and things like that. OK, so let's look a bit at the details. We know that there are 60 babies involved. We also know that they were certain ages. So that's fairly young. So five weeks through to 23 weeks. This is probably just dependent on on, on sampling. So remember research methods and how do you gather your sample? Um, and they are able to get these particular people um, to take part in their study. What they did is they went into the people's homes. OK. So it's naturalistic in that we are trying to look at their normal behavior. And they continued this um, until they were one year old. And then they go back six months later. OK, so for some of the babies, that's several visits that they would have had. Um, you know, if you're coming in at least kind of 12 times or so for some of the babies, maybe 10 times at least for others. And what they were asking the mother is, is how did the baby react to certain situations? OK, so the situations were if there was a strange visitor. OK, and what happens when they left the room and if they were left outside a shop. OK, so this leaving outside a shop is not necessarily um, something which we do now. We're a lot more wary of kind of leaving kind of babies unattended. But you've got to think about if any of you have seen the show called The called the Midwife. Um, and we see that, you know, the buggies are really, really big. Shops are really, really small. I know you would you would have your supermarkets and things like that. But I'm talking about like a corner shop or kind of a small kind of shop. And you probably wouldn't be able to move your buggy around. And if they did ever leave them outside the shop, it would have been they could see them through the window. And also there's a bit of community um, come up, upbringing as well. So people would look look out for the baby. Um, but of course, we have at least three different situations which they are being observed. And this is what they find. And this actually becomes fairly um, important to us. And we see that they are one of the first kind of researchers to kind of talk about this. So the first things they say is that it's about seven months old that the baby forms the initial attachment. OK, and I suppose um, 
if you think about kind of the development of a child, they are kind of getting to a point where they are alert, they are very interested in their surroundings. They've also kind of had had lots of other things that can kind of sit upright. Um, they can, you know, they can kind of move around a bit and things like that. That seven months old seems about right. And but they said that the reason that they were saying that it's seven months is it's at this particular stage that the children start to show separation anxiety. So if the mother actually leaves them, um, they start to kind of be a bit wary. Up until this particular point, most babies are, are happy to be cared for by particularly anyone. As long as you're not being mean to them, they're kind of quite happy. But then also they go on to say something quite important about the strength of attachment, saying the strongest attachments are those from parents who are sensitive. And it's sensitive to the children's needs or the infant's needs. Okay, so in other words, um, if you were wondering where reciprocity may come in or, or interactional synchrony, it seems quite likely that if you're able to spot that your child has a need and you're able to respond to it, because remember, babies can't talk. They can cry and they can make kind of noises. And so often a baby cries um, or kind of makes a particular noise because it has a need. And of course, if you can pick this up and respond to the need, it's obviously quite important that you have a strong attachment. Now, that's not to say that parents kind of are good or bad at this at, at any stage. There's a lot of kind of, often it's it's kind of male parents who are looking after the baby and the baby cries, so they automatically uh, change their nappy. Baby cries, so they automatically feed the baby. But if we consider the whole rep reciprocity aspect of the previous video, it could be that actually the baby just wants to have some kind of interaction with a face, with a person, um, and wants to be cuddled or played with or, or something along those lines. So it's quite an interesting thing. They're spotting this already, that a sensitive parenting is quite important. And then we see that um, looking at the cohort of 60 babies, that by 40 weeks, okay, so this is just under a year, that 80% of the babies had a specific attachment. So in other words, they are are attached to, stereotypically probably would have been the mother, but they're attached to a person, okay? And then we also see that a percentage of them are starting to have multiple attachments. So in other words, it's this idea that once you form one attachment, you can potentially form more than one. This is genuinely quite important to us, these findings. And so that's why I use it as a key study. And then when they went back after 18 months, um, we see that actually half of the children, it says only half, it says we're principally attached to the mother. Okay, and obviously I have a picture of a father there or a model that's pretending to be a father. Um, but this is an area in which Shaffer and Emerson kind of stand out from the other key name, which is Bowlby. And they're talking about this idea of, of kind of saying that the babies do have multiple attachments and that actually the one of the primary attachments is not always the mother. So if you think about only half, it's not necessarily means that half of them are then principally attached to the father. Think about other people who may care for the child. There's grandparents, there's siblings, um, and there could be other people who kind of come in and out of the child's life that they may well be principally attached to. And we also kind of get this understanding that actually it's not just the fact that the mother's there. It's the fact actually that there's somebody sensitive to their care. So there we go. We have um, a key study which is quite important to us. So from that, of course, we can then jump forward. I, I've decided to to go to a later publication. So it's kind of 30 years later, so to speak, um, and specifically refer to Schaffer's stages of attachment. Now, of course, um, they, he wrote about this sooner than this, but I'm, I'm taking this particular kind of, uh, kind of draft of it. And we see that he has four stages. So the first stage is called pre-attachment. And of course, we all understand the word pre. This is before attachment. Another word that he and other people may have used is asocial. OK, 
Okay, so if somebody is asocial, it means that they haven't kind of they don't know how to socialize. Okay, and um, and there or there's no specific socialization. It's kind of like friendly to everyone, kind of interact with everyone, and and that's kind of key what we find here for the first six weeks of the child's life. They pretty much are are kind of happy to be um, kind of interacting with anything, including non-human objects. That's kind of often why we do have like cuddlies, we do have rattles and toys and stuff like that, because a child is pretty much distracted by anything that is is around. Okay, and and we see that these objects and humans, there's no kind of real difference between them because there isn't the socialization process. Now, of course, it doesn't have to kind of stop at six weeks and it can be before six weeks, but we find this is the typical stage where they kind of interact with anything that kind of distracts them and makes them happy. And I suppose the other thing we could say is that they're just kind of being stimulated by absolutely everything. And so therefore it's quite important that we see this. Okay, so then we have that we start finding that the asocial phase sort of kind of is coming to, to the end um, of this at the six weeks. And we see that faces become more and more important. OK, and we see this both in either kind of we can use puppets and toys that have the facial facial expression on them. And they kind of seem to be kind of calmed or soothed. Soothed is a very good word to use with um, attachment um, by faces more than anything else so then that kind of leads quite nicely into stage two um, and because obviously now we find that human beings are preferred over objects but we call this indiscriminate indiscriminate okay so if i if i mean most of you are probably used to the word or seen the word discriminate or discrimination um it's kind of a terrible aspect of kind of society and prejudice and things like that, that people do discriminate um, kind of perhaps uh, down particular particular lines. But it's not meant to be always used negatively negatively within the, the English language. Um, so, you know, you might prefer coffee over tea. So you, they are discriminating between your preference between one hot drink and another hot drink. Um, and so therefore, this is kind of where this is, is going, is to saying, well, actually, there isn't this di discrimination, there isn't this preference, okay, this isn't a preference, because I'm not discriminating, I'm being indiscriminate. And so it says, they show preference for human company, but they accept cuddles and comfort from any adult. Okay, now this is actually quite handy in the sense that many children now, these days, perhaps are cared for by some form of childminder or nursery. And if they were being discriminate, they would say, well, no, I don't want to be cared for by this particular person. I want to be cared for by that person. Now, of course, once again, babies can't um, articulate this. They can't say this. So they might show discomfort. They might cry. They might take a long time to settle down but what we find is as long as a person's actually being kind to them they pretty much are happy to be cared for by most adults and so we find that the attachment behavior is called indiscriminate because there's no difference between people now this is not necessarily a long stage we see here that it's it's kind of for the for about the first six months or so that we have this particular stage but then we get to kind of the important stage three, and this is where we move from being indiscriminate to discriminate. And we actually see that now the child is making a preference. And of course, this kind of fits in quite nicely with what Shaffer and Emerson were talking about, because they talk about the seven months here. So in other words, they're getting to a point where they are kind of talking um, ab about, they've observed this in their Glasgow study, um, that babies are choosing from about seven to eight months. And it says here, the babies start to, sh to show or display anxiety towards strangers. OK, and also, once again, anxiety when separated. OK, and of course, it's discriminate because it's a particular adult. It's somebody that they kind of want to be with. And, and, and what we find here is it seems to be the biological mother, about 65 percent 
of the cases. Now, this is also just because um, if you look at kind of even still socially, mothers are tend to be seen as carers and fathers providers um, or or there may even be a choice where mothers do choose to stay at home and look after their children or something along those lines. But we are finding that it is often the mother. Now, it doesn't have to be the mother. It's got to be anyone who's sensitive to the child's needs. OK, so we say here that they are now formed a specific attachment and we can call this attachment a primary attachment. Primary coming first. OK. Now, later on, Bowlby will talk about primary attachments as being kind of more important. Um, Schaffer is not that um, keen on kind of going down that particular route of saying one attachment is more important than the other. It's primary as in first. OK, and, and so what we say is that the baby looks to this particular person for security, comfort and protection. And that's quite nice because if we kind of kind of blend this into stages of attachment and Bowlby's kind of theories as well, we see that what happens is that there's a strong belief that having a primary attachment or a first attachment gives that baby enough security to be able to explore an environment. Because obviously if they have this comfort in somebody else, if they get anxious or if they kind of get scared or if they get um, anything that can go back to that primary attachment figure. Now, if you don't have that, you might be less willing to explore OK, also, there's this kind of this trust that they will kind of be there for you. OK, and of course, that's quite important in terms of attachment. We then move into the last stage, stage four, and we just simply say that this is called multiple attachments. And we find that typically speaking, that babies start extending their attachment behavior towards other people. OK. So they extend this attachment behavior towards other people, okay? Now this can be siblings, often it's grandparents, um, but anyone who they regularly spend time with. And of course, um, during that specific attachment phase, they were potentially wary of strangers. Now they start kind of opening up again um, because um, they've kind of learned that, well, actually mother's there or the attachment figure's there and that they can form attachment. So we learn from one to kind of go on to the other. And of course, this is uh, important for you to kind of recognize that often if you have been um, with a child minder or if you have been in a nursery and stuff like that, you probably did have a strong attachment towards that particular fig figure. Maybe you still remember who that particular person was. I know that um, there are a couple of child minders who work um, in this area and their children um, kind of obviously grow up and then some of them come to Cooper's. Um, what we find is even with my own children, we had two child minders principally when the, the children were babies. So Ruth was actually a family friend. And I still feel that my daughter has this very strong love and affection towards her and um, because she spent a lot of time with her in her care. And then we also have Frances, whom kind of basically brought up Barnaby in terms of being a child minder for three days a week for his first first three years, four years of, of his life. So that's quite important that we kind of see that these multiple attachments are quite important and can aid us towards kind of getting us um, kind of working back into the environment. Because um, if you are a, a person who needs to go to work, you need to entrust your children in some, some kind of care. And of course, if they have the right kind of caring environment, they can form these multiple attachments and everything will be okay. So there we have, we have the stages. And of course, it's important for you to be able to name the stages, be able to roughly describe what happens in each, each stage, and also equally be able to um, kind of give some kind of time frame of what it is. Now, of course, we are unsure whether they would ask us to write an essay on this, um, but most of the textbooks do have a form of evaluation on this. And so therefore, it's important for us to kind of have a look at these stages, both evaluate Schaffer and Emerson, and also evaluate kind of the stages of attachment. Um, and even though I absolutely love Schaffer and Emerson as research, it's kind of my, my go-to research, um, we can have a look at some of the concerns that we have. And the first one is a limitation, because it says here, um, we just got to be careful. The first stage is actually called a social. So a bit like when we're looking at Metzkoff and Moore and interactional synchrony and reciprocity, what can we actually find out um, from the babies? Because they are very, very young. 
So it says here that they have poor coordination, are generally pr pretty much immobile. Okay, so in other words, it just makes it difficult for us to understand or make any form of judgment about what we observe. Now, kind of link this with research methods and observation techniques and stuff like that. We know that the babies won't have um, any change in their behavior. They don't tend to kind of care um, that they're being observed. But of course, they they are clumsy. They might just do certain things or kind of cry or kind of be unhappy because of something else that's going on. So it's very difficult to for us to make that type of judgment. So then ultimately, it means that we don't know what their feelings or cognitions are. And, and so what it does, it limits our understanding of what is actually going on during those stages and potentially makes um, kind of our, our knowledge of that unreliable. Okay, now that's that's a bit of a bit of a given. I wouldn't necessarily run with that particular point first. I'd maybe look at some of the other ideas. The next one is going to be a theme that will run all the way through the attachment course, and 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 this is this idea of conflicting ideas about multiple attachments. Okay, now Schaffer and Emerson, and certainly Schaffer in terms of his stages, is very much um, quite happy to talk about multiple attachments. However, we have Bowlby, the other really big name in, in the United Kingdom and the world. He's saying, well, no, um, that all babies or most babies form a single main carer. OK, and so he's got a bit of a hierarchy of kind of care where we have this one primary carer or primary attachment. Um, and that becomes more important than all the others underneath. OK, but Bowlby is kind of kind of leading that particular kind of understanding of it. But we have other people who say, no, it's not like that at all. It says we've got to consider culture um, and we see that babies can form multiple attachments um, to, to a whole bunch of different people because they might be with different people all the time. And so it becomes a limitation because we can't have a clear understanding of what really happens. Now, I've got two children, and I've observed them very closely, obviously, and I'm yet to be convinced about either approach, whether it's a primary hierarchy, uh, hierarchical attachment or multiple attachment. I clearly do believe that both my children are able to form multiple attachments, but what is kind of more important? And it could be down to context. So, for example, some of you might be in a community or in a particular household where you were with lots of different people, different family members, church friends and, and extended family friends and things like that. So, therefore, multiple seems to be the norm for you. Or it could be that you were with a single parent, or maybe you're in a context where you had a parent that went off to work and used to leave before you woke up and come home after you went to bed. So you might have spent months and months not really seeing a parent because of them working these long hours. So context may actually be important, but of course it almost becomes like a contrast between either primary attachment that becomes important, uh, Bowlby actually calls this term monotropy, or we see this multiple attachment. So for us, in terms of our understanding of stages, we need to question this idea of, well, what is it? Um, because clearly Schaffer is saying multiple attachments. But I've kind of distracted from the important work of Schaffer and Emerson. Um, and of course, a couple of things we need to know that they do have this ecological validity now, I'm assuming at this stage you do actually know what that means, but it's a form of external validity in terms of its matching kind of context of the child. Um, what was happening is that the observations were actually done by the parents. So it wasn't that the people went into their um, households and then observed them and then made the judgments. They were asking the parents about kind of what they did in different contexts. So in other words, the babies were acting normally. It says you're unlikely to be affected by the presence of observers. And so, of course, we are very happy to say it is their natural behavior. Um, but, of course, the problem with this particular study is more the fact that it could be unreliable. Okay, 
because the mother itself is not going to report any inconsistencies or any kind of difficulties that they may have. They might, they could have um, some kind of demand characteristics, trying to kind of appear to be a good mother or, or things like that. Um, I don't think this is necessarily a problem. I think most people in a longitudinal study, you kind of get to see what is actually going on over time. Um, but of course, we have to be wary that maybe they're reporting falsely on this. But of course, I don't want to distract from the fact that there is a lot of strength to this particular study. And as I mentioned about this idea of eliminating kind of negativities, the longitudinal study is quite important because the follow up and being observed regularly means that it does have internal validity. So any confounding variables may actually be kind of eliminated over time because you're not making just one or two single judgments. So we say that this is a strength because um, because I can make nice, strong conclusions about that particular baby, about that particular household. But of course, we do know that there's never kind of a perfect solution to this. And so, of course, what I'm doing here is a back and forth between different points and certainly would help you if you're having a discussion on this. We do also have another form of bias that could creep into this because it was a particular small cross section of society. Remember, we told you it's only 60 babies and mothers and it's in a specific part of the UK. OK, so it's part of the UK, but more specifically, Scotland. OK, and of course, we don't know whether that behaviour in that particular area is kind of something that we will be able to generalise to the other target population. So we do say that there's a limitation, um, that the sample does not represent all caregiver infant interactions. Okay, we see that the data itself might actually be biased. Okay, we also know that they were from the same district and the same social class. So what about culture? We have class, we have all these concerns about whether things are going to be different in different parts of the world, different parts of the country, different class situations. OK, so if this was kind of a particular area of we can look at the economic wealth or the socioeconomic status. And also then the last one is this idea that it was done 50 years ago. So is the research that we did then actually going to be relevant for today? So we could say that in different class, different culture, different time frame, child rearing practices may vary. OK, child rearing practices. And it's this variation that's a bit of a problem. So, of course, there's this problem with generalization. So it's difficult to generalize to other social and historical context. Is it relevant today? I'm not really sure, because how many stay-at-home mothers do we typically have? Do we have more? Do we have less? Um, if you did this study in Upminster, where we have a particular level of socioeconomic status, would this be different to Romford, which is not that far away? Or if we move to Barking and Dagenham, would that also change the context once again? So ultimately, what we have here is quite a good kind of discussion, looking at the stages of of attachment and then kind of questioning kind of the validity and the, the context of Shaffer and Emerson and also the, the outcome of the stages. I hope that you have found it interesting. I know that certainly it is something which you have to get your head around um, in terms of kind of appreciating attachments important part of the course. Just to end with, we've got to kind of two things, um, just to kind of raise a, a few kind of ideas. Um, that you need to start thinking about, and especially within attachment, we often have conflicting ideas. And, and of course, the question here, and it's not so much about methodology, but there is a question of how. Remember my first point is saying, actually it's really difficult to study children, and so therefore, or infants, and therefore we need to be wary of kind of what we assume after studying it, okay? So, so you know, a baby might be crying because of of something that's going on in terms of maybe a discomfort it might kind of be niggling for something and things like that in fact 
Um, my son was born with club feet, and from six weeks of age, um, he used to have two double plaster casts all the way up to his hips, kind of looking as if, you know, and, and, and often parents used to kind of stare at us as if they were saying, well, what kind of monsters are you that you're allowing your child to, to have broken their legs, both of them, because that's what it looked like. It looked like there was something wrong that they had to have these plaster casts on because, they, you know, they've been, you know, they must have had something happen to them. But of course, the context was was part of the, their treatment that he had to have what they call serial casts, where they put the casts on week after week and kind of manipulate the foot into the correct position. So, so just bear that in mind when you think about kind of, okay, so Schaffer and Emerson um, and Bowl, we often kind of see as people kind of being at odds with each, each other, but they're all trying to do their best to understand infant attachment. And so this criticism comes from Bowlby. So for example, Bowlby says that we need to be careful of what we say is an attachment, because especially this idea of distress, and it says that children kind of play with other playmates. Okay, and sometimes when that playmate has to leave, they cry, but it doesn't mean that they have a significant attachment. Because it says here that in Schaffer and Emerson, if we look at kind of partly what they're trying to do, they're trying to observe what happens when the baby is left or when the baby is playing with somebody or like whether the mother leaves the room, whether they get distressed. But of course, it could just be that that's pretty much normal and not necessarily a sign of attachment. Now with this extra content, you can just simply forget about it. But I thought I'd kind of raise this idea that we do really need to be careful of how we actually view kind of the outcome of Schaffer and Emerson's study because that has led on to Schaffer's stages of attachment. Finally, we just have a very simple question here and it actually was part of the genuine exam so you can look it up. And it just simply said, name three stages of attachment identified by Schaffer. Okay. So of course, that's just kind of indicating to us that we do need to be able to name the particular stages. There we go. I've kind of, it's quite a long video today, but I'm going to split it up in terms of the actual lessons. I hope you, that you've enjoyed it. If you have any questions, obviously, please do email me.